Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Our question this morning that we're going to try to answer is, what is the future of the Republican Party? Which I think is a very good question. I'd like to know the answer to it myself. Uh, and there's no one better suited to try to give us an answer than Carl, uh, the famous or infamous, depending on where you're, you're sitting, Carl Rove, who, of course, is a Fox News pundit, a Wall Street Journal columnist, and a former advisor to George W. Bush, Carl Rove es un ex assessor de George W. Bush. <laughs> so is, that, is that better or worse than Beto or, or Corey's Spanish last night? I, I don't know, but I guess, Carl, my first question would be, what, what do you think of all the Spanish speaking uh, last night, and does it put pressure on Mayor Pete to talk Norwegian in tonight's debate? <laughs> Uh, Senor Lowry, <laughs> buenos dias. <laughs> Una cerveza, por favor. Uh, uh, first of all, we've got this, the, the television set here is, we're looking at David Brooks. And I don't know what the conference organizers are trying to suggest to us here. He looks, it looks, he looks extremely thoughtful in what yeah, he's saying right yeah. now. I'd and really he's got the good gestures, and he's in a sort of a maroon-looking thing. I mean... Would somebody please turn off this television so we don't have to look at a <laughs> better looking guy the next 50 minutes? Or we also we be, need subtitles, though. He's before off we get time. into the questions, though, I, I want to say, uh, first of all, thanks for having uh, uh, conservatives to the Aspen Institute. I remember coming to my first Aspen Institute in 2008 after leaving the White House, and they asked me to come, and I uh, checked into the hotel, and uh, they gave me my room key, and I'm walking out of the lobby and across the driveway and up rolls a white uh, Range Rover with uh, four people inside all wearing their badges and the guy leans out of the front window and says, fuck you, fuck you, <laughs> fuck you, and drives off. So, I, I, I said to myself, tolerant Aspen as I know it. And, uh, <laughs> also, before we get going, I like your idea and I wonder if we can do it now. Rich suggested that we have you all vote on, the, on how you enjoyed the seminar before we begin to speak. <laughs> if you want to hear us, you need to give us good scores. All right, so we'll circle back to the Democrats uh, in a bit. I'd be, so I'd be happy to launch on the Democrats now, if you like. Let's, we'll, we'll circle back. Let's, right. let's start with the, the elephant in, in the room, obviously, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, I have, uh, myself, my magazine, have a complicated relationship with Donald Trump. We invade against him very strongly. Uh, in the primaries, he called me a loser repeatedly. He said I should be banned uh, from TV. But uh, I've had a little bit of a, a rapprochement with him that I guess began a little while ago when I, I came back to my office one day. And I found this brown envelope from the White House on my desk. I was very curious what it was. I opened it up, and it was a ripped out page of one of my columns from the New York Post. And I consider the New York Post the nation's newspaper. Most importantly, the President of the United States considers the New York Post the nation's newspaper. And it's this, uh, it's this column I'd written about just what a dominating cultural and political presence Trump is. So even if you're a Republican who wants to distance yourself from Trump, you want to run away from Trump, there's just no way you can do it. And I thought I had uh, a lot of incisive and some disparaging references to the, the president in this column. That obviously made no impression to him on him. What caught his eye was the headline that the editors had put on this column, the New York Post editors. And the headline was, there is only Trump. And Trump had taken out his big, big uh, black um, Sharpie, it circled the headline, drew a big arrow to it, and wrote, rich, so true, Donald J. Trump. <laughs> So that, that's, that's been my, really my, my last three years have felt like that. Um, so Carl, what, uh, he obviously has a really strong hold on the party. How strong do you think that that hold is uh, in historical context and what accounts for it? Yeah, well, he has an enormously strong hold on the, the rank and file of the Republican Party. And, and look, we can argue about it. He says it's the highest ever. It's not, but, but it's, it's very high. And it's durable, and I think it's an expression of two things. One is, there are a lot of Republicans, I mean, remember, at th th this point three years ago, leading in the polls and by uh, not insignificant margins were, in declining order, Jeb Bush, Scott Walker, and Marco Rubio. And the Donald had just come down the escalator. And what he tapped into was a sense among a lot of Republicans that they felt beat up, ignored, <laughs> diminished, 
scorned during the Obama years. And they wanted somebody who would stand up and take a brick and throw it through the plate glass window. And he said he'd do that, and he did. And we're in a very tribal moment. We're talking mostly, I hope, today about the Republicans, but let's be honest, both political parties are broken. The old sort of post-World War II consensus that guided both political parties has sort of evaporated in part because they each had success. But it, both of these parties are broken. They got their problems, we got ours. He's our leader now, and in, in, if people attack him, we rally to him. The average Republican says, he's my guy. Uh, we had an experience, I'm not gonna point you out in the crowd, but this is an experience I have virtually every day that I'm in public. Somebody will come up to me in an airport or come up to me after a speech or come up to me in a, a restaurant and say something that somebody just said to me just before we came on here, which is, I like what he's doing, but I don't like how he comports himself. And uh, so you get in, you dig, you dig a little bit deeper into that, you know, 89, 87, 91% of Republicans who say we, we favor him and strongly favor him in many instances, and you do get doubts. But they won't express them and they won't act on them <clears throat> because they consider the moment to be too critical. <clears throat> and so uh, we, we, we saw a little bit of the same for Obama. Once Obama left, President Obama left the stage, the angst of the left wing of the Democratic Party came out and people are now saying things that they would never have dreamed of saying publicly about him, uh, about the leader of their party. And, uh, but it's just the moment that we're in. I saw something with Bill Clinton too when he was under the most intense fire during impeachment is when right. Democrats yeah, rallied around is, This banner. is not a new moment. It's been coming on for some time, but it's, it's, hit, it's, it, it's hit a new peak. So how do you evaluate his performance in office, and I, I would think it's, it's now conventional wisdom among a lot of Republicans that Trump has managed to do things that no other Republican would have done. Do you agree with that? Well, or no other president would have done. Uh, take NATO. Um, we've had three presidents in a row who have faced the same problem of the United States being forced to share a greater share of the defense burden for Western Europe and have all, you know, Clinton, 43, and Obama all tried to to do something about it, it was it was on the topic of every uh, of every NATO meeting and most G8 meetings and every bilateral meeting with a NATO ally. And we, you know, we deliberately went out of our way to cultivate uh, on a bilateral basis all the members of NATO to say. So Bush had a chance to say to him, you know, we were bringing in the Danes and the Norwegians and you name it, just to say, boys and girls, you need to live up to your. And he comes in and you know. Th throws a fit, excuse <coughs> me, and give them credit, they're now starting to pony up. <coughs> so the undiplomatic language and the lack of process and the impulsiveness does have some, some upsides. And, and not only would not another Republican have done it, or has done it, but no, no other Democrat would have done it as well. So, and then just following on from that, more on a kind of policy or Philosophical scale, how do you uh, how do you view the changes he's brought to the party or is trying to bring to the party's orthodoxy? Is it destru destructive and a dead end, or is it a useful freshening up of the party's agenda, or something in between? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry, I've got allergies or something that are kicking up here, so sorry to hack. Look. Um, First of all, think about it. The things that are most popular are the conventional things. Good judges, tax reform, uh, strengthening the military, seeming to stand up for American values, no apology. Uh, he got a great deal. I mean, it was very uncharacteristic. I had that moment, and I suspect you did too, in March of 2017 when he comes in and some reporter asks him, uh, the Syrians are reportedly using gas on their people. Would this cross a red line for you? And he says it'll cross a, it would cross a lot of red lines for me. Then I thought, oh, here we go again. And what happens? 100 cruise, 104 cruise missiles come roaring out of the eastern Mediterranean and destroy a core of the Syrian Air Force like that. And suddenly the message is, if the President of the United States says don't do something, you better care, care about not doing it. Uh, pulling out of uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, 
the conventional things are popular. I'm, I'm, I'm personally uncomfortable with, you know, look, I, I want to do something about China on trade. Uh, we brought China into the WTO in 2001, believing that it was better to have them inside the tent, bound to an agreement that said you have to operate in a certain way in conformity with international norms, rather than have them outside. But beginning in the late first part of the decade of the 20th century, and accelerating in the last, uh, say, 10 years, they've begun to do a lot of bad things. And Trump has come in and said, I want to I want to do something about it. Now, my problem is, is that I'm not certain what exactly he wants to do. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, a, I'm not a mercantilist. I'm not a protectionist. I'm a free trader. And free trade to me says you abide by the rules, and there are penalties if you don't abide by the rules. So if they're not abiding by the rules, I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of, you know, we were the administration that applied temporary tariffs to the Chinese for violating the rules on steel. But sometimes I don't understand exactly what the policy is, and I think it depends to some degree on who's the last person. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a major theme. And something I give them credit for in a number of areas is instinctually sensing something's wrong with the status quo or wrong with the consensus. There's no doubt that all presidents uh, of either party had failed in North Korea policy. That's true. It is worth trying something new. But what is that, and, and yeah. how is it going to work, yeah, and are you just failing in it? No, and no, 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 look, look, look. look. I'm, not, I'm not one of these people who says that Clinton, Bush, and Obama failed with North Korea. That's like saying, oh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt failed because he, you know, he, he wasn't able to convince Adolf Hitler in 1936 to forego his future direction. You know, we're dealing with an independent state. The guy's a nut. And he has ruled, he has ruled this country as his father and his grandfather ruled it before in a horrific fashion that's hard for us in the United States and in the democracies to get a handle on. This is a vast slave state where a very thin number of people at the top live something close to an ordinary life and everybody else doesn't. And the, the, the president, great, give him credit for trying to reach out. But, you know, I'm at the, I'm Bush 41's funeral. So I'm sitting there in my chair, my appointed chair, and there's two chairs sitting next to me with reserved on them. And I'm like waiting for whoever's going to show up. I'm like, it's Dr. Kissinger. And so he sits down and he says, chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. The guy loves political gossip. The more salacious, the better. So, but I, it was the National Cathedral, so I didn't feel comfortable sharing. He says, he says, Carl, uh, what do you do? You have any observations from your experience at the White House on the, on the decision-making processes of President Trump? <laughs> you were there for seven years and have some familiarity with the national security apparatus and the normal processes, even on the domestic side. <laughs> I said, "Well, Dr. K, there ain't any. I'm dealing with the White House on an issue, and there's no normal deliberative process." And he said, well, uh, my impression is the same, and I worry about it in a moment of crisis for our country. Well, I do too. So far, so good. But we got a lot of things on our plate and a lot of things that can pop up. And, for example, on, if you're going if you're gonna call off a strike, don't let people know you had a strike and called it off, in my opinion. <laughs> And I'm being serious. I mean, you know, look, and if you're, and I thought, imagine what would have happened if they drowned, the, if they shot down the drone, the United States said, this is unacceptable, we had quiet in Washington, and then they floated the story to the New York Times that we had cyber attacks on their missile systems and on their, and on the units that had been behind the bombing of the, of the two tankers. What would the message be? I, look, step back for a moment. I don't think that the Iranians are taking much you know, they may go out and say things publicly about about uh, uh, about the president backing down, and we, you know, we the American beast, you know, the devil has stepped back. But if I, but I'm, my suspicion is in the higher command of the Revolutionary Guard and the Defense Ministry in Tehran, they're saying, "Oh shit," because if this, these reports are accurate, that we went and knocked out control systems over missiles and radar, and basically ran. Wild through the computers of the uh, of the entity that that oversaw the attacks on the on the uh, on the tankers, I, I bet they're saying we we better get Cymatech and, and a couple of other security who call up those guys in Russia and see if they can come down and protect our computers. But this is this is 
he, he is a fresh impulse. The country was ready to hear him. I'm not certain that they were, that, you know, there's, there's a big divorce between his approval ratings and his favorability, and it's particularly bad when it comes to the people who strongly favor him, the people who strongly want him reelected versus those who strongly disapprove of him and those who strongly want, don't want to see him back again. And they better do something about that. They got time, but it's, they, they better be thinking about it. And for, an, for a White House that doesn't have a, a process, that I'm worried that they don't have processes even inside their political apparatus. Yes, so where I was going with the North Korea thing was not to disparage his predecessors and say there was an easy solution in North Korea, just that it was worth trying something new, I, I think is a good impulse. China, that, there is, that the status quo is unacceptable, I think he's right on, whether pure tariffs and not building an alliance to try to ring fence yeah. China and focusing on that, I don't know whether that's the solution. On health care, I think this is, this is a classic Trump uh, establishment Republican thing, where Trump is absolutely right, where he says, Republicans need a health care plan that covers everyone. Maybe we can't cover everyone, but covers a lot of people. And you have actually the establishment of the party, like Mitch McConnell, say, no, we're not going to do that. That's too risky to have our own health care plan. And because the White House is so uh, disorganized and Trump doesn't have you know, the policy chaps or the focus, the White House can't do it. But if he just says, oh, you know, the Senate's going to do it, and Mitch McConnell has no interest in doing it, it doesn't happen. So yeah. it seems to be another area where his instinct is correct that something's wrong or needs to be adjusted, but the follow-through isn't there. Yeah. Look, look don't surprise your allies, because uh, you can't necessarily count on them to be with you, even if you carefully and patiently hold their hands. We patiently and carefully held the hands of the Republican Congress in 2003 and 2004 on uh, Social Security reform. We're, we're going to put together a commission. You got any ideas about it? We're going to ask Daniel Patrick Moynihan to be the head of it. We believe that he's committed to the idea of reform and has the moral authority as a Democrat. Are you okay with that? We're going to have an equal number of Democrats and Republicans on it. We're not going to have congressional representation. Hold our hands, hold our hands. We're going to make this a big part of our 2004 reelect. Social Security modernization, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it. And then, of course, we get reelected in 2005. We make the effort, mistake on our part. We should not have led with Social Security. But we led with Social Security. And of course, then we find out that there's Tom DeLay going around saying, if you want to get reelected, don't have a goddamn thing to do with this idea. So you get surprised even if you're patiently holding hands, but you really get surprised if you're not holding hands. And, and I'm, I'm, I think you're right. The president's instinct is right. I'm not certain we need a big health care plan. I've, one of the lessons I've taken away from the whole experience with Obamacare is why was Obamacare unpopular when they were trying to pass it? Because it looked like it threatened everybody. If you like your plan, you can't keep your plan. If you like your doctor, you can't keep your doctor. Why is it popular today? Because only 7% of Americans are touched by the Affordable Care Act. So the rest of us have got our policies. Now, they're affected implicitly by, behind the scenes by the Affordable Care Act's distortions in our health care system. But we're sitting there saying, you know what? I still got my policy from Aetna, United, Blues, whoever I got it from, and my employer's paying for it, feeling good about it. I got my Medicare Advantage plan, it feels good about it. So, okay, Affordable Care Act, that's helping some people who, you know, had pre-existing conditions, so I, I'm in favor of it now. So anything that's big and bold and ambitious, like Medicare for All, scares the bejesus out of people. And on the other hand, saying, well, we ought to allow people to save more tax-free for that out pocket medical expenses, or we ought to have a catastrophic health care plan that can, be, you know, that can be made available to low-income uh, people with government support so that they ever face an incredible life-threatening illness that are covered. I mean, there are lots of things that Republicans can say and do that, that, that to the 158 million households that are covered by employer insurance would say, well, that's good. That, that sounds good to me not going to really necessarily affect me, might be on the margin good for me, but it's going to help people and it's not going to blow up the system as we know it. In the meantime, we've got to blow up the system as we know it, but we've got to be polite and kind and sensitive and long-term about it. Yeah, what you said about surprising you know, members of your own party and how that's not a good idea, it seemed early on in the administration it's going to be even worse than that. And there could be a real breach between Trump and Capitol Hill after the, the failure of Obamacare repeal, and there are stories that uh, Trump was kind of making fun of Mitch McConnell you know, in the Oval Office, and there was a New York Times story about an emotional phone call between Trump and McConnell, and a longtime McConnell aide called me trying to push back against that story, and he's like, Rich, you know that can't be true, that there was an emotional phone call, because Mitch McConnell doesn't have emotions. <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, so Carl, let's again, going, going back to the, the divisions with, within the party. But, you know, for me, I, I live these kind of doctrinal fights every single day. It's kind of my, my job. Um, but you have nationalists and populists now who are even um, more nationalistic and populistic than Trump and, and really uh, strongly believe that this is the future of the party. You have uh, TV hosts on the right praising Elizabeth Warren's uh, economic plan because it's, it's running under the auspices of economic patriotism. What do you think of this tendency? One, one way I think about it is, is populism and, and nationalism have always been part of the conservative appeal. You look at Ronald Reagan, he wouldn't have won the nomination in 1980 if he hadn't opposed giving the Panama Canal back to uh, Panama, and he said, look, we, we, we built it, we paid for it, it's ours, which is a, a nationalistic sentiment. I think is wrong, and Bill Buckley and George Will and others who opposed him on that were right, but he probably doesn't win the nomination, uh, or at least it helped him that he took that position. So how do you, how do you think of nationalism? Well, I, I'm with you. Populism has always been part of successful Republican appeal. Uh, I'd take more, you know, in the general election in 1980, Reagan said government is not the solution, government's the problem. That's a little bit of a populist thing. The idea of an overwhelming, we got left populism and right populism. And we're in a moment where both are being expressed. Left populism is, is that the economic system has been rejiggered in favor of big corporations and the little man's getting screwed and we gotta rebalance the relationship between the little man and his government by a lot of free things. Gotta get the weight of, college loans off of them, got to get the weight of, got to make the big boys pay their fair share, we got to make the corporations and the stock speculators and what William Jennings Bryan, who incidentally carried this county with nearly 100% of the vote in 1896, this was a hotbed of populism, uh, you know, we got to get rid of this, the, the leeches on, and, and money lenders on Wall Street. But there's also a right populism which says the relationship between government and the little man has been screwed up. To, the, to the, the advantage of government and to the disadvantage of the little man. The government is bailing out the big banks with our money. The government is giving Solyndra our money. People who don't deserve to get our money are getting money out of the pockets of hardworking people to do things like, you know, weird stuff. And we ought not to, you know, we ought not to do that. And so we got to rebalance the relationship because the elites are looking down their nose at us. So Trump represents that, that impulse. But it is an impulse. Mm -hmm. And I think that the problem with the populists and the, first of all, the alt right should be unacceptable. They are worse than the John Birch Society that Bill Buckley read out of the conservative movement in the 1950s. Here. Ought to be read out of the conservative movement. There's no, right, no place in our movement for those people. But the populists, I understand what the impulse is, but the question is, what, are you really in favor of the wealth tax? Are you really in favor of you know, uh, a tax on every a stock transaction, great. Go explain that to all those people who have 401ks and IRAs and Roths that now every time that every month when, when, uh, when, when they, the company makes the contribution to the, to the uh, 401k the, and, they, uh, and it's an automatic investment into a, into a, a mutual, broadly based mutual fund, that 3% is gonna be taken off the top to pay for Elizabeth Warren's wealth tax because you are the rich who are not paying your fair share. So I, 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 I get, I get the, the purpose of what they're saying, which is, if you look at it, there is a part of our country that's being hollowed out. I get that, you know, northeastern, or excuse me, northwestern Maine is no longer timber country. I get that the Ohio River Valley, the upper Ohio River Valley is no longer coal and steel country. And we, and as, and, and, but the, what's the best way to deal with that? Is the best way to deal with it with the people who run the post office and screwed up the VA? Or is it to find ways to incentivize our economy and our educational system and our communities and our states and localities to step into that breach? So kind of a historic, historical question for you, Carl, and something I've wondered a lot about the last couple of years. So when Trump was rising in, in the primaries, in my office, I, I have bookshelves groaning with all these conservative tomes, with my, my Russell Kirk, my Frederick Hayek, uh, all the rest of them. And I, I would look at those shelves, and I would say, you know, we've, as conservatives, we've always thought ideas matter, and, and uh, these great thinkers matter. They don't matter at all. You know, he had this guy, just with sheer force of personality, taking over the party and taking over the movement. 
And, and usually when you have that kind of shift, you see the growth of the movement. McGovern takes over the Democrats, but that's, that's for years, that's been a movement growing within the party. Now there was this, this little tendency within, within the Republican Party or on the right, but you wouldn't have thought, oh, it's about to just you know, successfully nominate a, a, its candidate and take over the party. So how do, how do parties change? What's the interaction between the intellectual environment and context of a party? How important is that? And just how important is, is the sheer political you know, horse flesh of candidates in changing? I think you've got to look at this on two levels. You've got the macro level of what was going on in our, in, our, in our society, our politics. And people were looking for the guy who would stand up and say, by God, it's going to stop. And look, I love Jeb Bush. I went to work for his dad when I was 22 years old. I, I worked, I spent my life in willing servitude to the Bush family. But what was Jeb's first message? It wasn't his message, but, but some idiot in his campaign figured out, I want to make this the message. And it is, I've raised, Jeb has raised $100 million, is going to outspend everybody. Well, that, that, that's, that's a message good for, you know, about 10 people in, who are former Republican National Finance Chairman, but that's not an opening message for your campaign. And, and I, I think there was a failure of the candidates who sort of were ahead of Trump to sort of have a compelling message. And Trump's message was, I'm going to shake it all up, and by God, they aren't going to be able to say bad things about us anymore, and I'm going I'm to I'm tell them what to. And it was powerful. And it, it, it wasn't enough to give him, I mean, look, he won the nomination by getting like, I think, 46% of the vote. I think he's the, he is the first Republican uh, since Gerald Ford to win the nomination while losing, while not gaining an absolute majority of the votes cast in a primary. But it was strong enough in a multi-candidate field to do it. So that was the macro thing. We, he seized on an impulse that was flowing through our, uh, our society. But the second thing is, is that, that he, he also had mastered some of the things that uh, were new, like Twitter and social media and recognizing that you have to be something of a fresh and new celebrity. And, but, you know, it, 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 if, if there had been, in my opinion, a more, if the candidates, the two or three or four serious candidates had been better with messaging early on, and if somebody had confronted him early on on some vulnerabilities and said, you're not the best guy to be lecturing us on this, that it might have had a different outcome. But, but uh, I, and like you, I had my own experience with him uh, I wrote a few columns in the Wall Street Journal that he didn't take, to, take too kindly to. So he shows up in Texas for his first rally in, in Dallas and stands up and for the first 20 minutes is excoriating me by name. <laughs> it's very unpleasant. I've been told, I didn't watch it, but I've been told it was unpleasant by my wife. It was very, uh, yeah. so, <laughs> so, so uh, in May of 2016, he's won Indiana. He's going to be the nominee. So he, he and I have a mutual friend, good friend of mine, who's a longtime friend of me of his, and he calls me up and he says, hey, kiddo, I've been talking to Donald. He wants you to write a column. He wants you to say something nice about him. I said, well, it was a Wednesday afternoon. I said, well, as a matter of fact, can I read you my column? We're in the final edit stages with my editors. It appears tomorrow. I read the column. Oh, kiddo, he's going to love it. He's going to love it. Will you do me a favor? At the end, when you say good, will you say very good? <laughs> Calls me the next morning and says, oh, my God, Donald is furious. He thinks you were, like, rude to him. He, he wanted you to be more sympathetic and positive. And, and I told him you were just giving him good advice and you were complimentary. Long story short, I end up having a three-and-a-half-hour-long meeting with him in an apartment in New York, uh, three of us. I'm, they bring me in, like, an hour before. He leaves, and they, they wait, make me wait for like an hour and a half, and then take me down the elevator to the tunnel that connects with the building to the south. So I emerge onto the New York street, literally one block south of where I entered so that nobody would see me, hat, coat, you know. <laughs> but it was amazing to me. He, he didn't expect to be the Republican nominee. I mean, he was sitting there saying, you know, you know I, I said, look, I feel awkward giving him advice. Well, you've done it twice. He wants to know how you did it. I said, fine, I'll come prepared to tell him about the decisions we had to make. And it was like, you know, first decision, how are you going to get to 270? We had to have several paths to get to 270. And I happened to mention that one of the paths that we had, to, we had to win four historically Democrat border states that had voted for Clinton Gore twice, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. He said, West Virginia? 
I did really good in West Virginia. I can win West Virginia. I did really good in the primaries there. I said, yeah, you're going to win West Virginia. But it wasn't that way in 2000. And he had no idea that West Virginia, I mean, Bob Dole lost it by 16 points. It was a Democrat state. When we went for it in 2000, literally political reporters were saying, you guys are morons. You're wasting your time and your money. But then I said, you know, I said we had four western states to go after that had been won once or twice by Clinton Gore, Montana, Nevada, Arizona, and won twice, Oregon, that we needed to either win the first three and we had a shot at the last one. He said, Oregon, I can do really good in Oregon. I'm going to win Oregon. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I said in 2000, uh, they just elected a U.S. senator. They had three of five congressmen were Republicans. They controlled the state house. They, had, they were down by one seat in the state Senate. They had two constitutional officers. They were on the way up. And we had Ralph Nader on the ballot with a real following in the kooks and nuts in Portland and Eugene. And we came within 5,500 votes of winning the state. But since then, it's gone hard left. They're, the party's been wiped out. Last statewide victory they had was 2002. They're down to one congressman. They have less than a third of the legislature, nobody in the state capitol. You can't win Oregon. He said, well, I'll win California. <laughs> I said, no, you're not, and here's why. <laughs> he said, well, I'll win New York. I said, no, with all due respect, Bernie Sanders got more votes than the entire Republican field combined. In fact, two and a half times as many people voted in the New York Democratic primary as voted in the Republican primary. You're 26 points down in the real clear politics average uh, against Hillary Clinton. She's won statewide twice. You're not going to win New York. And every day you try winning New York or California or Oregon is a day you can't spend in a state that you can win like Pennsylvania or Iowa. He says, I can win Iowa? <laughs> I said, yeah, you didn't do too well in the caucuses, but all those farmers out west, they hate her. And there are a bunch of blue-collar working class people, mostly Democrats and independents in the eastern part of the state that are worried about their jobs and trade, and you can win Iowa. And he turns to our host and says, why isn't anybody in my campaign talking to me about this? So a couple weeks later, he goes out and repeats my point. You've got, I've got to have a strategy to get to 270. I'm going to, have, I'm going to concentrate all my time and energy and effort in these states. And you aren't going to see me anywhere else except to raise money, but I'm going to be in these states, and that's why I want to tell you what they are. I'm going to spell out the 15 battleground states I've got between now and the Republican National Convention, but I'm going to tell you about three of them today. New York, Oregon, and California. <laughs> so I, I call up our host, and I said, well, he got the principle right. If the execution leaves a little bit to be desired. But it, it's, it's a constant reminder to me that, that everything about this experience is new to him. Running for office, being in the office, dealing with Congress. I mean, I can't imagine another president who would say, I'm having a bipartisan, we call them bipart, bicameral. Holt Egan has been in many of them. They're, they're, they're like going to the proctologist without a, an anesthesiologist present. <laughs> and so you got Democrats and Republicans, and they're in the cabinet room, and you're trying to find some common ground. I can't imagine any president saying, let's bring in the media and have them watch us. <laughs> but it's, it, it's him. Yeah. So um, let's, let's circle around a little bit to... If that ever happened, Egan would have gotten a professional shave, new suit, clean shirt, tie... And his, his wife, who was a budget girl, uh, her, that was her next name, budget gal, uh, would, have, would, have, would have made certain he was presentable. But that would never happen in any other administration. So let's circle around a little bit to 2020 and get to the Democrats a little bit, maybe five minutes or so, and then take some questions. So obviously, the way he conducts himself in office is, is often appalling. Um, but what, what do you think is to be said for his unusual personality attributes. I mean, a couple things jump out, out at me. One, and, and people that, that are always alarmed and fearful of him might, might not get this so much, but he's really entertaining and incredibly ebullient. And uh, during the, the 2016 campaign, a friend of mine had um, a friend who was an advanced guy for Trump, uh, and he was at an event in Virginia, and this ebullience accounts for at least some of the reason why he so often says things that aren't true. Uh, but the, this advanced guy is in the green room with Trump, and they're, they're in Roanoke, Virginia or something for a rally, and Trump you know, cares about crowd size. So he wants to know how many people are there, and, and he hasn't seen the crowd himself yet because he's, he's back in the green room. And the advanced guy says, sir, it's, it's amazing. I've never seen so many people at an event in this area of Virginia. It's packed to the rafters. There are 5,000 people. And Trump says, 8,000 people, that's incredible. <laughs> and, then, and then he literally he gets on the phone. He's like, John, 
I'm in Virginia, you won't believe it. There are 10,000 people here to see me. Like, you can't help it. You know, in real estate, they call it puffery, and that's sort of what he's lived his life uh, in New York doing. But there's that. I think there, there's also um, the, the, uh, the ability to kind of fix uh, an adversary's weakness and uh, pound away at it. Obviously, I don't think there's anyone really in the national stage that yet hasn't been able to diminish, except for maybe Nancy, Nancy Pelosi at the moment. Um, and, and then there's the fact he's just never, despite all the controversies, despite all the high wire acts, he's never once in the primaries or as president shown a, a crack of weakness. Never, ever, ever. I remember just one little thing from the primaries. He was on the stage, and he attacked the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this trade deal that is meant to ring-fence China, and said, we, we can't get into this because you know, we don't want a, a trade deal with China. And then Rand Paul's like, actually, Don, you know, China's not in this, this agreement. And anyone else would have like, slinked off the stage in shame. No effect on him <laughs> whatsoever. And he just has that amazing uh, ability. Yeah, well, he'll need it. It's going to be a tough race. Um, I, I, you, you mentioned his personality, and I, I, I worry a little bit that, that we're seeing too much of it in, in sort of the political commentator role. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's probably to his advantage to be more the president role. So he goes off to the G. You should meet with him and tell him this. Well, <laughs> actually, actually, I've sort of been, I've sort of have been communicating the message, and it's not going to have any much effect. So what the hell? But you know, the G20 is a great moment for him. He's there meeting with you know, and we got it. We got the ten midgets on the stage last night, uh, three, including three Spanish speakers, Hablo uh, Hablo Español, and um, and and he's tweeting about it. And I worry that he's wearing out. You'll, you'll notice uh, there have been some studies recently. The engagement with his social media postings is way down. And I think it's because people are getting a little worn out. I have people mm -hmm. come up to me and say, I'm a big Trump supporter. I'm a big Republican. I'm a big conservative. But I'd, I've turned off the television. I don't read the newspapers. I'm worn out. And there is something about this. The pace of this has been, you know, we, we're, we're living, you know, each year is like six political dog years. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like... Uh, you know, the pace of it, and, and, and I worry about it because the, 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 at the end of the day, in November of 26, uh, 2020, one of the major questions, not the biggest question, but a major question is, do I want this person in my life and in my face and on my television screen for the next four years? And if it's Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders uh, versus Donald Trump, then I think Trump's got an advantage. If, on the other hand, they're worn out on him, it may be that say, well... You know, Joe Biden or that Amy Klobuchar, or maybe, maybe I can stomach Warren. I, you know, it's because the people that are up for grabs in this election are not ideological in nature. They're the swing voters. And the swing voters, they may be sort of centrist uh, thinking, but they may be cons more conservative on, on economic issues, more socially moderate on, on uh, cultural issues. But they really aren't paying much attention at all. We overestimate how many people are paying attention. Uh, there was a brand new uh, a, uh, uh, AP National Opinion Research poll on, on Democrats. Only 35% of Democrats say they're paying much attention to the Democratic presidential primary contest. And I, I suspect that's surprising to a lot of people in this room because it's clear this room, being at 910 on a nice Aspen morning in a thing about the Republican Party's future, you are all political junkies and in need of help. <laughs> <laughs> serious, serious counseling help. I mean... It's covered for both he and I on our medical plans, but I'm not certain it's covered on yours. So, and a quick thought, Carl, on the, uh, just the dynamic of the Democratic race, and we'll take, try to take a couple quest questions. So, it, it, it seems um, I, I got what the Democratic race, race was going to be wrong, which probably is not unexpected, right? But what's been surprising to me is all the early entrants uh, seem to think that the rabbit to chase down the track was Bernie Sanders. And then you get Biden get in and you know, uh, jumps to this immediate lead. Might, might be soft, might not uh, last. But it's been very notable in the polls. You have much of the field, and especially Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, splitting the, the very liberal vote. And the very liberal vote is what we're kind of all cued to think is the Democratic vote, because what you see on Twitter is what you see on cable TV. But then there's this massive swath of the party that is not represented uh, on uh, those platforms that's somewhat liberal or moderate and conservative. And Biden is dominating 
uh, among uh, that part of the party, which is too wide, really, just to call just a lane. So it just seems bizarre to me that so many Democratic presidential candidates who live and breathe this party and should have known better seem to have neglected uh, that enormous part of the party. Yeah, yeah I think you're absolutely right. The uh, Democratic Party is older uh, and le less uh, left-wing than, than the candidates think. Uh, it's, and, and, and he fits in with it. Uh, and there's an age disparity in the Democratic Party. If you're, if you're um, sort of middle-aged and older, you're more likely to be for Biden. If you are, uh, and, and then second a distant second Sanders. But if you are younger, you are more likely to be for a Warren or a Buttigieg or a, uh, a Warren or a Kamala Harris or a Cory Booker. Interestingly enough, one of the key tests is going to be South Carolina, where Biden's strength is among older uh, black women in particular. And we forget that, that in the South, the Democratic Party is church-oriented and uh, older uh, in terms of participation. Uh, the problem with the Democratic Party in the South is that they have not yet gotten younger blacks to participate to the same degree that their elders have anywhere close to it. So, uh, you know, there's, there's Biden. It may be weak, and I think we've got a long way to go yeah. in the next seven months, but he is, he, his base of support is among the people who tend to turn out, and the vote among those that don't tend to turn out is being split among yeah. a bunch of wingers. Now, having said that, they've they're, they got four problems. They're beginning earlier. Last night's debate... Uh, first debate, end of June. First debate for the Republicans was the end of August. Now, that may not seem like much, but there's five months between the beginning of the Republican debates in 2015 and the first vote in Iowa. There's seven months between the first debate for the Democrats and the first vote in Iowa. Second of all, they're front-loading. Everybody now is piling in to that first month from February 1st to March 3rd. Four years ago, 24% of the delegates to the Democratic National Convention were selected in that period. This time around, it's 48, and it may climb over 50. One or two more states may climb into that period. And everybody, you know, the early states include the home states of a lot of the candidates. California, which has traditionally been June 6th, is now going to be March 3rd. Kamala Harris. Yeah, you know, uh, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Texas, Julian Castro, and Robert Francis O'Rourke. I mean, we're going to have lots of people uh, who... Uh, who are going to have a state? Third, they're a proportional state. They're a proportional convention. Uh, on the Republican side, we're more winner take all. Marco Rubio got 17.7 percent of the vote in Texas in 2016 and got three of 155 delegates from Texas. If he were a Democrat, he would have gotten somewhere between 31 and 35 of 100 uh, of 155. Uh, but the Democrats are: you get 15 percent, you get delegates. Republicans are winner take all. Uh, my final personal favorite change, they say they're the Democratic Party, but they really are the only aristocratic party in America. They have the House of Lords, the superdelegates, unappointed, unelected, apparatchiks, current and past office holders, distant names from the past. Uh, Donna Brazil's a pal of mine, and she lives in Louisiana, and she is a superdelegate from the District of Columbia. And I said, how did you become a superdelegate? She said, you. Is that a beg your pardon? She said when Bush defeated Gore, she was Gore's campaign manager, they rewarded her by making her a superdelegate. And I said, well, have you had to be reaffirmed or re-elected? She said, no, no. Two ways you stop being a superdelegate. You resign or die. And she said, I don't intend to do either, so I'm going to be a superdelegate for that time. <laughs> well, the, the new rule change is they can't vote on the first ballot. So what happens if the combination of lots of candidates, proportional voting, and front-loading causes them to end up going into the final stage of the half of the delegates being elected between March 3rd and their convention in July are, in, are, are uh, don't allow anybody to get to a majority. And so it becomes the first convention since 1952 for the Democrats that goes to a second ballot. And on the second ballot, 775 unelected apparatchiks come rolling onto the floor. Now, I was on the floor of the Democratic convention in 20. 16. I've been there since 2008. If you think heads spin, wait until you, see you go with me to the Democratic floor, uh, to the convention floor. But th those Bernie people, they're, they're not nice people. <laughs> <laughs> they may eat granola, and they may have been at Woodstock, but they are not, you know, mellow. <laughs> and, and what happens if the hard left of the Democratic Party has voted for somebody, and on the second ballot, Somebody else is nominated by the votes of the superdelegates who are, after all, likely to be more practical people. 
Uh, and this could be blood on the floor. This could make Chicago 68 look like a romp in the park. So we have a couple minutes left. I'm not sure how much time we have left. The, the clock back there got stuck at 9.22, and now it's actually ticked up to 9.23, so we're gaining time. Four minutes. Okay, questions, please. Budget girl. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've described a group of voters that are, that are disaffected with elites. And um, how would you, what are their hot button issues? How big are they? And how do um, leaders reach them if they're not Donald Trump? Yeah, look, I think it depends on the disaffected voters are on the right and left. So I'm going to focus on just the Republicans. He's hitting the right buttons with a couple of exceptions. I do think. I don't like it, but immigration is a hot button for them. Trade is a hot button issue. America's role in the world and our military are a hot button. Political correctness is a hot button. I also think that with that group of people, there is a growing concern. We're talking about you know, the, the, the small businessman in Athens, Tennessee. We're talking about the woman who's got the, you know, works in the insurance company in Delaware County, Ohio. They are worried about debts and deficit and nothing's being done by anybody on this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hear this, I see Doug moving his head, but I hear this increasingly as I move around the country. Grassroots Republicans say, I like what Trump is doing, but by God, we got that $22 trillion deficit. We can't keep going. Other questions? In, in the back. Um, George Will was here earlier in the week. I don't know what you <coughs> feel about him. Uh, George Will was here earlier in the week uh, trying to figure out what the future of the Republican Party is. I thought that was one of the topics to discuss. Can you, can you sort out what conservative means going forward? Well, we're going to have two panels this afternoon on this, and one, one I'm going to be the interviewee inflicting pain on the four people who are going to have to answer that question. But this, this is we've spent more time on the current state of the Republican Party, but we are in a mess. Uh, I'm a, I've got a man crush on George Will. So I want to be clear about that, but but we are in a we are in a we are in a place where the party is going to have to figure out what it stands for because Donald Trump is he going to be here either for four years or eight years, but after that after him it's hard to see what comes next because Trump's populism is an impulse. Populism is always hard to find. Why is it that populism in its purest form, left and right, has arisen in American politics around a personality? and not been sustained after him. Andrew Jackson, populist. Does anybody think Martin Van Buren carried that forward? You know, William Jennings Bryan. He succeeded by, you know, in the leadership of the Democratic Party after losing three presidential elections in a row by Woodrow Wilson, for God's sake. You know, the 1930s, you know, Huey Long. Was that, you know, what, what happened after, who, who replaced, George Corley Wallace, when he, you know, rose up. Who, 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 who carried that on? Somebody grabbed those people in each and every instance, but who was it that took that populist banner and carried it forward? So that's why I'm interested in two, two groups of people. I'm interested in particularly the, the younger members of the U.S. Senate. I'm interested in the Dan Sullivan's and Rob Portman's and Tom Tillis's. Josh Hawley. Josh Hawley's and uh, in, a very good inside operator Kevin Kramer and John Cornyn and Rick Scott. I'm interested in that crowd because it strikes me they're going to be around to help frame what the Republican Party is. I'm second of all interested in governors. Now the problem is we don't have a lot of sort of, in the 1990s we had a huge group of you know, governors around the country, Engler and you know, Tommy Thompson and you know, lots of people who are doing interesting things. We don't have that many doing interesting things, but we have some interesting gubernatorial personalities, Nikki Haley, who I think has a great deal of potential. And the question is going to be who out of that sort of, you know, governors or former governors emerges over the next couple of years. But the Republican Party is going to have to create itself one way or the other after Donald Trump leaves office because Trump is an impulse. And tell me where he's going to be on an, you know, tell me what the philosophical foundation of him, of, uh, that he's going to, that's going to govern his reaction to a policy, to an issue that may emerge in the future, and I'd be, I'd love to hear it, but, but he, look, these, he, he thinks, he thinks uh, uh, Hayek was Fred Hayek, who, with whom he did a real estate deal on the Queens in <laughs> 78, and, and von Mises was the guy who was interested in having him do a Trump hotel in Vienna, but he's not really certain how that played out. 
So I, I think just really, really quickly, the Republican Party is never going to be the same. And I don't think it's going back to what it was. I don't think there'll ever be a figure like Trump again. I mean, it's obviously sui generis. But I do think the party will have to be more populist, will have to be more nationalist, more socially conservative, not quite as libertarian, but has to think through what it means to be a more working class oriented party. And um, not just the white working class, but also think about how, and, and this is, I, I think, one of the tragic kind of missed opportunities uh, for Trump, at least so far, is I, I think with his working class politics and appeal, he has more potential than most traditional Republicans to tap into a segment of the black and Latino vote, uh, working class and middle class Latino and black males, uh, I think would be a fertile area. So how do Republicans appeal to those kind of voters and become a, a more diverse party through a working class populism that should not be defined um, by race, but all this needs to be th thought through. And one of the points of me you know, staring wistfully at my bookshelves is usually it's thought through and then you do it. Now a lot of things that have been thought through, Trump has ended up taking off the shelf and doing. You know, conservative judges, like there's been a 30 year generational effort to think through what originalism means and to bring up uh, conservative jurists through the Federal Society and other organizations. And Trump's just picked all that, all that off the shelf. That's great. The problem with his departures from orthodoxy in part is no, one, no one's done the thinking. There's been no populist or nationalist journals that have published very serious articles. Some have sprung up in Trump's wake, but it's kind of too late to affect it now. So I think there needs to be a real serious rethinking uh, going forward. I, I think Rich is absolutely right. I'd add a couple of things. I'm, I'm, I, populism is not endurable except as a, as a few notes in the symphony. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm interested in sort of a populist tone but populism itself, the focus that we've got on populism of an un, uh, unceasing war on the elites, uh, is, is, it's, a, it's a useful note to strike, but it's not a governing agenda. The other thing that I'd say is, is that, look, th this is what we face. Thus has it always been. Mm -hmm. Political parties, you know, think about it. The, the party of big government and high taxation and the Gilded Age is the Republican Party and the party of states' rights and low taxes and limited government is a Democratic Party. Parties recreate themselves over time in response to changing conditions and changing coalitions. Right. It's one of the great strengths of the American political system, which is why I love the Electoral College and everything else that keeps us sort of in a two-party straitjacket. Because, you know, I used to do work in Sweden, for God's sake. I mean, I'm a Norwegian, and I'm, I'm having to try and help the Swedes sort out their scrambled politics with the, you know, Liberal Party, the Center Party, the Christian, you know, the, uh, the Finnish-speaking People's Party. You know, I mean, we, we, we've got this great thing, and it depends on the two parties recreating themselves in a place that brings them sort of towards not the fringes of American politics, but towards the broad, broad center, center right and center left of America. Just one more point on that. So we do tend to think that there was this conservative golden age where there was just a consensus. And you look at the great founder of my magazine, William F. Buckley, he was, he was publishing libertarians who thought we shouldn't have traffic lights. And guys who wore capes and yearned for the old days of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And they're all vigorously arguing with one another and in real time sort of changing and sussing out what the iteration of conservatism uh, should be. And that effort has never stopped. It's just now it's, it's the, the argument's more intense or feels more intense because of the age of Twitter and because, because of the emotions that Trump brings to surface. Yeah, but right. now, buddy... You're in charge of that. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks a lot.